Good morning. Is that better? Can y'all hear me? Can you hear me in the back? I remember that from camp. Well, good morning, and thank you for uh, being here this morning, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to bring a lesson. Appreciate the encouragement in prayer and that great singing. This morning, we are going to be talking about the concept of positive growth, and of course, what we mean by that, positive Christian growth. I like the little handwritten diagram that I found to sort of illustrate uh, some of the meaning of this, and you see in the top right-hand corner of your screen that uh, just like John the Baptist said that he must decrease so that Christ, and that Christ would increase, that certainly should play out in each of our lives. So that's the, that is the idea this morning. If you look at the concept of growth in the Bible or do a word study about the word grow or growth, what you will find is that in the Old Testament, you see generally the use, the use of the word grow in more of a literal context, like a, a plant or a tree will grow or a young man will grow in stature. And then as you move through that and you get into the poetic books of the Bible, you see a little more abstract use of the word, uh, maybe saying that the, the night grew dim or the sun grew dark. So this idea of growth is a progress of a process. And then in the New Testament, what we're going to focus on mostly this morning is that more figurative use of this concept of growth in the life of a Christian, about our faith increasing and our uh, effectiveness to God becoming uh, greater than it has been. And that's what we want to think about and, and, and aim for in our lives, is that am I more effective to God or for God now than I used to be? And is that a process that is, con process that is continuing to progress? So uh, with that in mind, that's kind of an introduction to what we're going to talk about. And we do have... A scripture here that sort of bears that out for us, 2 Thessalonians 1, uh, grace and, to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So here we have Paul writing to that church at Thessalonica and explaining and, and bragging on them to, to them about the fact that their faith has continued to grow and increase, that they did not get to a, a level of uh, where they felt satisfied with that, but that they continued to have energy and effort towards a growing faith and, and being more effective for God in spite of the persecutions and tribulations that they endured. So with that in mind, I would like to call my young assistant, Connor, up here for a little bit of an illustration. I, Melanie and I have been watching the Olympics. Everybody, anybody else been watching the Olympics? I've been, we've been watching. You can stay down there, buddy. You're not preaching today. So um, get Connor to take this tape measure, and he's going to walk straight down the aisle um, until I tell him to stop and slow down a little bit. Okay, that's good. So you walk back this way just a little bit. I'm going to stop the tape right here at the beginning of right there. Okay, you lay that down and stand right there and raise your hand. Connor, you can see where he is and where the tape stops right here. Thank you, buddy. You can sit down now. That measurement that Connor just measured out is 29 feet, 4 inches, and 1 quarter inch. 29, 4 and a quarter. So um, just past the bench back there where Cheryl's sitting and all the way to right here, that represents the world record for a long jump. So a human being got a running start set his foot, took off flying through the air, would have jumped over Allen and Miss Elise and landed in a sand pit right here. Pretty impressive, I think. Do y'all think? Pretty impressive. 29 feet, 
four and one quarter inches is the record for the long world record for the long jump. It was set, and I should have advanced the frame here. It was set by a man named Mike Powell. Uh, Mike Powell set this record, and he did not wake up one day and decide, I am going to go out today and jump the world record long jump. There was a process that happened here for him to be able to accomplish that. Uh, and that's, the, that's what we want to talk about this morning with the kind of the Olympic theme in mind, that Mike uh, Powell had to have three things in mind to motivate him to do this. Um, as I said, he, wasn't, he, didn't, he didn't just wake up one day and decide to do this, nor was he born with the ability to long jump uh, almost 30 feet. Uh, he had to practice. He had to train. Uh, and he had to realize that a purpose for him in life was to become the absolute best long jumper that he could become. Now, we're all familiar with, and Nick asked me to do this, so I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, uh, humor him. Who's that? Usain Bolt. Uh, we've all seen that. You know what? Usain Bolt could not jump as far as, um, uh, as Mike Powell because that's not his purpose. His purpose is to run faster than anybody else in the world. So this morning, let's talk about the fact that until we realize our purpose as Christians, we will not realize our full potential. Secondly, we want to talk about progress. The previous world record for the long jump had stood for 23 years. Uh, probably a little, almost as old as Mike Powell was when he set the record. So he had to work his way up to that. It wasn't something that happened overnight. He had to decide that he wanted to be a long jumper, practice and train, and be disciplined, uh, and have this progress that would take place through life before he was able to set that record. And then, of course, we know that for the athlete, there is a prize, medals, recognition, fame. Nowadays, that comes with endorsements and career opportunities uh, and wealth. But as Christians, we know that the prize is far greater. We have the hope of heaven, uh, that crown of life. But we also have all of those blessings that we get to enjoy along the way. In athletics, especially in running, uh, track and field, there is a concept of the personal best. or the, You might hear somebody say, hey, I set a PR today. Uh, out running the 5Ks, I might set a PR. It's not going to be anywhere near the PRs that you see on the Olympics. But you know what? I did the best I could and improved on myself. And that's kind of the concept. Each of us has our potential that God gives us. Are we recognizing our purpose, making progress along the way, and realizing the prize uh, that lies before us, and, and living with that prize in mind. So that's a, uh, an introduction to what we want to talk about this morning. Before we look at those three points, though, let's look at the fact that there is a concept in the Bible of growth. We've already talked about this, and the Bible also talks about uh, positive growth and uses that kind of the, the negative aspect of that with negative growth. There's a scripture that you see up on the screen there, Proverbs 28, 19, very familiar. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Another translation speaks of that more as when there, where there is no revelation that the people throw off restraint. The idea here is that God's people, uh, understanding who they were and what their purpose was to be God's people... Uh, also had leadership in front of them, and, and this leadership would give them uh, the revelation of God that this is what you're supposed to do, this is how you're supposed to live your life. And when that becomes absent in their lives, they throw off restraint. They, they no longer have the discipline to live the kind of life that God wanted them to live as a people. When there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no revelation, people throw off restraint. So you see a, a level of, of adequacy and, and progress. And then when the vision declines, the effectiveness of the people declines. So the, this is the idea of negative growth. On the positive side, prophetic revelation, people thrive. 
the negative side, in the absence of direction, lazy and undisciplined, and people perish. Another example of this is from Isaiah 6, verses 8 to 10, where Isaiah was receiving his commission from God. He wrote in chapter 6, I heard the voice of the, uh, the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make people... Make the heart of this people dull, their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart. And listen to this in verse 10, and return and be healed. So the wording is a little unusual here. You, you have to read uh, after he says, go to this people, there's a colon there. And then he gives the characteristics of these people, He's not telling them not to hear and not to have... Uh, hearts that aren't dull. He's saying their hearts have grown dull, uh, their eyes don't see, their ears uh, are heavy and do not hear, they shut their eyes. So uh, the idea here in this prophecy of Isaiah is to, to, to reinvigorate those people back to a progress in serving God, to return and be healed. Um, Jesus thought that this was important enough to reiterate in the book of Matthew 13, uh, beginning in verse 14, it says, In them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn. Now listen to the difference here. So that I should heal them. In, in the time of Christ and beyond, that healing came from him. He was the source of that healing. And then, of course, in, in X verse tw or chapter 28, Paul himself reiterates this using almost the exact words of Christ. In verse 24 of chapter 28, he says, And some of them were persuaded by the things which were spoken. Uh, some disbelieved. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed. After Paul had said the word, one word, the Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet, our father, saying, and then he recounted uh, the same thing that we saw in the book of Isaiah and the same phrases that Christ used quoting Isaiah. And if you, if you notice there, there's only two possibilities of how people reacted to this message that Paul gave. Either they were persuaded by it and it changed their lives or they disbelieved. So this morning we should think about uh, in which camp we sit. Are we persuaded by uh, the, the need for uh, progress in our lives as Christians to, to grow, to have a purpose, uh, make progress and, and keep our eyes on that prize? Or do we disbelieve because our lives show that we aren't motivated by what we know to be true from God's Word. Purpose, progress, and prize. Let's look at this idea of purpose. We're going to talk about the Christian purpose more in general at first, and for that we will go to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter, beginning in verse 1. 2 Peter, beginning in verse 1. Peter writes, Simon Peter, Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which we have been given an exceeded, to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through, these, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So let's break this down, looking at the general purpose uh, uh, for Christians, the, the, the nature of our purpose as followers of Christ and those who are loyal to God. Number one, God gave us our purpose. He gave us our purpose. And it says all things 
that pertain to life and godliness God has given to us. We understand that he gave that to us and it is now recorded for us in the inspired word. So it comes from God. What better place to derive your purpose in life than from God himself? Secondly, it is Christ-centered. And the, the scripture says, through the knowledge of him who called us. So our purpose comes from God. It is about his son and the knowledge of him and all that that entails. And we read scripture in the Bible. It says they began to preach Jesus to him. And we can only imagine all of the wonderful information uh, in the instance of uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch that was given there. We know that the, it concluded in the eunuch saying, what hinders me from being baptized? I need to be in Christ. I have this knowledge now. So it is uh, God-given and it is Christ-centered. And then thirdly, it is a purpose that has promise. You read, read that section and you see... God has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. And it's a, it's, a, it's a very good study to examine what those promises are. Number one, we understand that we have this opportunity to have eternal life. That in the hereafter and eternity, which is comparative, compared to our time on earth, uh, such a vast uh, amount of time that we can't even conceive, we have the promise of eternal life, eternal peace in heaven with Christ and all of those uh, who are faithful. But we also have promises in addition to that that, that that will be blessings to us along the way. And finally, uh, it, it takes us out of the world and into Christ, our purpose that is God-given. Uh, partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world. So, I hear people opining about the condition of the world today and the fact that we've, we've got uh, difficult decisions and perhaps maybe you feel the way many people do that we've got decisions coming up and not a lot of great choices. Uh, that, that those types of things and the crime and the, the, the hunger and the condition of the world can be very disappointing and depressing. But... We have a promise that we can be taken out of the sinful world and put into and enjoy the divine nature of Christ. And as Christians, that is certainly part of our purpose. So that's the general purpose. Uh, but I want to talk about a little bit more specific and make this a little personal for us today. And to do that, we'll use the story of the parable of the talents. Parable of the talents. We're familiar with this story, of course, and it's a, a great story, and we're not going to take the time to read all of that text, but we know generally what happens. Uh, the, the master goes on a trip. He entrusts his, some of his wealth with three uh, servants. One gets five talents, one two, and one one, and we know that the five-talent man works hard, doubles his, the two-talent man works hard, doubles his, and the one-talent man decides that he is going to react out of fear and going to be lazy and hide his in the ground. And when their master returns, uh, all of them kind of get uh, the response from him that they deserve based on their effort. Um, so from this, we learn on a, and looking at a, what is my purpose on a specific personal level that God gives us all an opportunity to use our gifts. God gives us all an opportunity to use our gifts. Uh, he, he, he gives us all things that we can use to enhance the kingdom and bring glory to Him. Secondly, He expects us to try to fulfill our purpose. When you read that story, uh, the, 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 the parable of the talents, and you see the reaction of the master when he comes back, you see the positive reaction to the first man, the positive reaction to the second man, and then uh, the wrath that is, is, uh, is, is easy to understand from the, the master when he, he says wicked and slothful servant. He expects us to, to do our best to fulfill our purpose. But even more importantly than that, he does not expect more of us than we are capable 
each according to his ability is what the scriptures say in that story. Uh, I forgot to ask Connor to go out to the sign and get somebody to hold the doors and get a running start and see if he could jump and land up here on the podium. From uh, He would not have been able to do that. He'd come close, but he would not have been able to do it. That would be expecting more than he would be capable of. God does not give us or expect more of us than we are capable of with the talents that we have. The question is, uh, am I identifying my purpose in life for God, and am I working toward fulfilling that? But we don't have to set world records with it the first day. And next, productive effort is rewarded, and we see that enter into the joys of your Lord when the, the, the five-talent man and the two-talent man return, but also, uh, and perhaps more importantly, fearful, lazy abdication is considered wicked. You can find that in Matthew 25, verse uh, 26. Uh, and what I mean by that is if we, if we hide our talent in the ground and make excuses that I knew that you were a harsh master and I didn't want to mess up, then that, that, is not, that is abdicating our responsibility. That's making excuses, stepping aside, saying, I can't do that, I'm afraid I can't do that, so I'm not going to try. That, in God's eyes, is considered wicked. Well, how do I step out of what we consider our comfort zone and move forward? Uh, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, we have to realize our purpose. Uh, generally speaking, uh, and there's a, um, uh, an illustration that I wanted to share with you uh, that says... Turn back to that page, bear with me. There is a relationship which makes life complete. Without that relationship, there is a void, a vacuum. Many people, even those who are well-known, can attest to that void. Of course, we understand that relationship being our relationship with God. You've heard of H.G. Wells, famous historian and philosopher. At age 61, he said, I have no peace. All life is at the end of the tether. The poet Byron said, my days are in yellow leaf. The flowers and fruits of life are gone. The worm and the canker and the grief are mine alone. And then the literary genius Thoreau said, most men live lives of quiet desperation. How sad. Ralph Barton, one of the top cartoonists in the world, left this note pinned to his pillow before taking his own life. He said, I've had few difficulties, many friends, great successes, I've gone from wife to wife, from house to house, visited great countries of the world, but I'm fed up with inventing devices to fill up 24 hours in a day. How sad that someone would believe that their purpose in life was something that they had to come up with themselves. Our purpose in life comes from God. It's centered on Christ, and it's our responsibility to identify it personally uh, and, and realize it. The Christian sitting on the pew is not much good to God unless he or she is active in his service. A little more light-hearted uh, illustration uh, happened when a Scotchman was demonstrating the game of golf to then-President Ulysses Grant. He carefully placed the ball on the tee, took a mighty swing, uh, hit the ground, completely missed the ball, and scattered dirt all over everybody there. Uh, apparently, he was not the one that invented the game because he did this six times, and six times he missed the ball. And Ulysses S. Grant uh, said, there seems to be a fair amount of exercise in the game, but I fail to see the purpose of the ball. Uh, so just like the ball sitting on the tee that's never hit, uh, when we sit on a pew and never do anything with our purpose, uh, we are useless to God. <clears throat> So, purpose. Now, progress. Our progress comes from, first, a desire of the Word. 1 Peter 2, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, laying aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word, as newborn babes, and I always leave that comma out, as newborn babes, Desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And I think all of us have experienced that God is gracious, God is merciful, 
that, that, that so much good comes from him. So he tells us that if we understand that, to desire his word, just like a newborn baby desires uh, milk. And three things there. Number one, we know that a baby must have nourishment to grow. And that milk is so important to the, the physical development of a child. Uh, and they will not grow without it, and they don't function well without it. We have all, that uh, those of us that are parents, have uh, figured out, uh, after uh, figuring out that there's not a manual, that the baby cries when it's hungry. And in many cases, the, the child will be given food, and then it will be calmed, and that will put it to sleep. Remember when Olivia and Victoria were born? They were premature. They were 3 pounds, 15 ounces, and 4 pounds, 14 ounces. They had to eat every two hours. And uh, that was an exhausting uh, concept, if you can imagine, feeding them every two hours. Melanie helped out, but uh, uh, we, we did what we could. Uh, and she was great. But about the time that we were both to the point of physical exhaustion is when they actually started sleeping through the night a little better. But a baby needs its nourishment. It has to have it. And if we are to progress in our lives, we need to desire the Word of God just like that, to have it to grow, to function better, and to be calmed and satisfied by it. Another way that we can progress is to rely on the church that God has given us. Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 16, and I'll read this quickly. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together uh, by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes what growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So this great scripture tells us that there are lots of different roles that can be played. This is the first century so we're talking about uh, apostles and we're talking about prophets. But uh, if we, we kind of modernize and paraphrase this, you know, some are given to be elders, preachers, teachers, encouragers. Uh, some are personal workers. All of us can have our part in forwarding the, the message of Christ and the local congregation in the church. And we should rely on each other to be edified and to grow up in all things how it works we're knit together uh, and we're in this together and we, we need each other and there is strength in numbers something I often try to tell young people and I'm so uh, happy that we have uh, such a, a, a great group of young people in this congregation I want you guys to rely on each other to stand strong against what the world is going to throw at you so we desire the word rely on the church and Finally, we realize that process is a lifelong pursuit. 1 Peter 2.21, one of my favorite scriptures, tells us that Christ suffered for us and died for us, and because of that, we should walk in his steps, learn that example, and walk in his steps. And following the example of Christ is not an easy thing to do. It is a quest for the perfection that is seen in the only perfect human that ever lived. So for us to continually progress towards that is going to be a lifelong pursuit because we know that we'll never really reach it. But we are perfected through him and can have that hope of heaven even though we aren't perfect. Lifelong pursuit. There's a, a great cellist named Pablo Casales. Uh, and when he reached the age of 95, a young reporter asked him a question. He said, Mr. Casales, you're 95, the greatest cellist that ever lived. Why do you still practice six hours a day? And the gray-haired man replied very humbly, because I think I'm making some progress. So our goal is to make progress 
every day of our life. And a question to ponder personally is, am I making progress in my life as a Christian? Backing up, do I know the purpose that God has for me? And am I doing my best to fulfill that? And am I making progress in that pursuit? Finally, we mentioned the prize. And we don't need to forget that there are prizes along the way. Life is tough. It's difficult. Bad things happen to good people. And we know that it's great for us to have this, this view of eternal life. And we need to live in view of the Lord's return. It could happen any time. We're not promised enough in it. But we also need to remember that we have the hope of heaven, but there are so many great blessings that God gives us along the way. John 10, 10 uh, he tells us, the thief does not come except to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you may have, you may have it more abundantly. That life, that abundant life that, that, that Jesus is talking about is what we're living right now. Abundant life, blessings uh, that come to us along the way. Proverbs 10, verse 6, blessings are on the head of the righteous. 28, 20, a faithful man will abound with blessings. Every good and perfect gift, James 1, 17, we know comes from God. Prizes along the way, blessings, whether it's the, the blessing of, of Christian fellowship, the blessing of what we're doing today, of joining together in worship and, and communing with God. All of those things are blessings, peace, uh, a place uh, to go to in a time of struggle, those who would reach out and, and, and comfort us and having the blessing, the opportunity of comforting others, celebrating with, with people in their triumphs and consoling them when, when they're going through something that's difficult. All of these things are blessings along the way and abundant life that we get to live. And we need to realize that, but of course, more importantly, we need to have... Uh, in view that prize that exists for us in eternity. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, do you know, do you not know, going back to our, our, our Olympic theme, those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And we've seen so many instances, you remember the old, those of us who are old enough, <laughs> The wide world of sports intro, bum, 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 the thrill of victory in the heat. We've seen that if you've been watching the Olympics. You've seen people setting world records, winning gold medals, and all of that is great, and we, we, we love seeing them celebrate and the happiness that comes with that. But we've also seen the agony of defeat. I remember one specific uh, young man that was very emotional. as a, 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 a French person. I think it was a hurdler. I'm not sure. Probably, it was a very specific discipline that he was probably there to run one race and he false started. And the Olympic rules are if you false start, you're out. No second chances. No second chances. That young man fell on his face and wept on the sideline of the track. He was so disappointed that his Olympic dream was over before it really started. We have a hope of heaven and thankfully we do have second chances. There's an eternal prize, but we have to run in such a way that we may obtain it. Thankfully, one mistake doesn't get us knocked out of the race, but we do have to run in such a way Paul tells us that we should obtain it. And then finally, Hebrews 12, 1, we don't want to miss out on that prize. Hebrews 12, 1 and following says, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So this scripture always sort of reminds me of that as if you were running into a stadium full of people who have gone before us this great cloud of witnesses that in Hebrews chapter 11, of course, we know that it's the, the, the Faith Hall of Fame, and this is the follow-up to that in chapter 12, the chapter divisions, of course, being added later. We, 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 we think about that great cloud of witnesses, and what I think about is those that I have loved who have gone before that I know to have been faithful Christians, and that they're up there cheering us on. 
and it says get rid of the stuff that's going to weigh you down. Lay that stuff aside. If you can imagine a, a sprinter trying to run with a 50-pound sack on his back and all of a sudden realizing, you know what, I can shed this off, I can shed this weight and run the race better. If I'm not mistaken, uh, the, the marathon is the last event generally in, in the Olympics. And it finishes in Olympic Stadium. And after the run 26 uh, miles, 385 yards, they run into that stadium in the last part of that race, and they're, they're cheered on by all those who are there to watch. And we want to uh, realize that, that that's us running a race. Lay aside those weights, refinish the race, keep, keep the faith, uh, fight the good fight, all of these uh, vision or uh, all these illustrations that Paul gives us in living a Christian life. And we don't want to miss out on that, that glorious finish when having realized our purpose, made progress throughout our lives, and realized the prize, we hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant, and realize that we have the opportunity to have that crown of life placed on our head for eternity. This morning, I hope that we are all striving to make progress as Christians. There may be some here who have not taken the steps necessary to, to be in Christ, to, to, be, to put on Christ, and to become a Christian, a follower of Him. If, if you've never made that decision, then the opportunity exists for you today to change that. Maybe there are some of us here who have made that decision, but throughout life have become jaded, disappointed, complacent, and need to kind of purpose and, and realize ourselves and redirect, re-energize ourselves towards service of Him. And that, that possibility exists, and we will help you with, with either of those things. And if you have any need whatsoever, don't hesitate to take that first step and come as we stand and sing the song selected.